and I, as Lydia mentioned, are writing the survey of recent developments for a bulletin of Indonesian economic studies. And since other organizations like the World Bank now do a very good job of producing reports on what happened in the last quarter or the last uh, two quarters, we're not doing that. Uh, instead, we're looking at a longer term issue, and that's the issue that you see in the, in the title up here. So let me uh, uh, try to be brief in talking about it. Rajesh will answer all of your questions. So uh, uh, Indonesia is experiencing a, a sustained period of quite robust economic growth. Uh, this diagram uh, shows three uh, booms in economic growth since the early 1970s. The blue line is growth starting in 1973, so they all start from a base year of 100. 1973 is the OPEC oil boom, goes towards 13 years. Uh, the yellow line is the boom that started in 1988 with the manufacturing export uh, growth. The orange line is the current economic growth starting from 2004. And the gray line is average per capita economic growth right through this period, about 3.6% per year. So these are three periods in which there's been uh, rapid economic growth relative to the long term in Indonesia. And what we can say about the current boom, that is the orange line, is that it is much more stable in terms of economic growth and it's been much more sustained at quite a high rate for Indonesia. So these are, in some important sense, good times for the Indonesian economy. What do we know about these good times? Well, uh, they create a lot of fiscal space in which uh, it maybe is opportune to think about uh, setting economic policies so as to lock in the gains from this economic growth against times in the future when maybe uh, growth won't be uh, as robust as, as it has been. If you've been watching the US stock market, you know that there is some kind of correction coming in the world economy. And uh, when that does, uh, it'll be much harder to have that fiscal space for making changes. So this is a good time to do it. The quote in the title, by the way, uh, is attributed to uh, US President Kennedy. He said, uh, when the sun is shining, is a good time to repair the roof. I'm not sure he was the first person to say that, but he's famous for saying it anyway, so uh, we attribute it to him. So then the question is, in terms of policy, what can be achieved and what should be attempted? Our focus is not on all policies, of course, but on particularly on policies that will sustain long-run development and poverty alleviation. So that's the narrowing of our focus somewhat. And the context of this discussion is very important to think about. That is, the kind of growth that Indonesia has experienced for the last 15 or 17 years has been rather special. It hasn't been driven by long-run uh, sustainable drivers like productivity growth. It has been driven by a lot of resource exports. Now, that's not the only driver of growth, but it's been a very important one. <clears throat> And uh, Indonesia has prior experience of resource booms. Of course, the blue line here is the oil and gas export boom of the 1970s. That's a familiar story to all Indonesians. Uh, one thing that's different about the current boom is that it's based very largely on uh, exports of agricultural products, specifically palm oil. Again, that's not the whole story, but it's a very big part of that resource export boom story. And this resource boom is different to oil and gas in some very important respects that I'll talk about uh, in just a moment. And those differences are going to motivate the work that we present uh, today. So let me think about the, uh, the differences in just a moment. Just to give you some indication of how important palm oil is, the blue line here is palm oil prices in world markets. Starting in the very early 2000s, they, go, they increased to their peak by a factor of about 2, and that is 200%. Uh, increase before dropping off. Uh, they have recovered since then, at least in the last two years. Uh, they've been back up about halfway from the last uh, data point that you see there. So this is part of a global increase in commodity prices, I'm sure familiar to all of you here. Uh, palm oil uh, has been a key sector in this boom for Indonesia, and this is the growth of palm oil uh, production in Indonesia, that's the blue line again, relative to other kinds of agricultural uh, crops or at least other uh, plantation crops in Indonesia. Um, right now palm oil accounts for about 10% of merchandise exports in Indonesia, so it's a big deal. Uh, and about half of that uh, production comes from smallholders, uh, that is 
uh, either uh, uh, independent farmers or more commonly farmers who are on nucleus estates, that is, they are connected to a larger plantation enterprise, but they manage their own land and their own uh, resources. And the oil palm or palm oil sectors uh, employ around about 3 million people in the Indonesian labor force, which is a pretty big chunk of the agricultural labor force in this country. So the numbers are big. What about the differences between this boom and previous ones? Well, if, you, if anyone went to Australian National University or uh, uh, read the literature on resource booms, then you know that that literature thinks about oil and gas export booms. And in that story, uh, the revenues from an export boom, a windfall when world prices go up, come back pretty much exclusively to the government budget. And then they get reallocated by the government to purposes that the government uh, gives preference to. That may be development expenditures, maybe other things. In the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, Indonesia used that fiscal space, that, that uh, windfall of export earnings from oil and gas, to undertake a tremendous push in development expenditures, uh, rural development, electrification, uh, road building, school building, all of those kinds of things. And it had a lasting impact on the growth of the Indonesian economy. Now, when we think about a decentralized export boom, that is, one in which a lot of the revenues are coming back not to government, but to corporations or householders or workers on oil palm plant plantations, then we have to think about how the spending e effect of that boom will differ from a conventional resource boom story where the government's making all the decisions. In this case, only a small share of the total revenue from the oil palm export windfall goes to government. The rest is going to uh, a lot of different, uh, much smaller agents. And their objectives are different as well. So we have to think about household behavior. We have to think about the constraints that households face when they make uh, spending decisions uh, out of this boom. And so we're going to talk about some of those constraints and some of the opportunities that policymakers might have to assist households uh, who are experiencing gains from the boom to allocate their uh, resources in the way which is optimal both to households and, if possible, to the economy as a whole as well. It's a different kind of problem from, the old, from your grandfather's resource export boom. Not the same kind of uh, policy problem at all. And we want to know, particularly, how the outcomes from this boom will differ, given that it's a different kind of uh, export boom. So, what will be the implications for the current generation of householders? What about their children? How sustained will this growth be across generations? And how will the economy as a whole do out of this? Okay, so then our focus uh, zeroes in on smallholders, on farmers with one or two hectares of land who are growing oil palm, who account for about half of oil palm production in this country, and therefore should have a very large share in the windfall gains from that rise in world prices that I showed you a few moments ago. Uh, the growth of smallholder oil palm production, very, very elastic, as you can see, a uh, very big increase in production uh, in recent years. What is surprising then, given that increase in production and given the increase in price uh, over the same period, uh, if you put those two things together, you get about a, what is it, a six-fold increase in the value of oil palm, uh, or palm oil rather, uh, production and export from Indonesia. Six-fold increase, a 600% increase over about 15 years. A very big number, right, for quite a large industry. So what's surprising is that we see relatively small effects among the smallholders who are key participants in this sector. And in particular, a, a study by Ryan Edwards, who some of you may have uh, met on his uh, pre previous work, found that a 10 percentage point increase in the area allocated to oil palm production in any district in the country is associated with a 10 percent decrease in uh, poverty in that district. Now, when you put those numbers uh, together with what really happened, they turn out to be very small. That is, the mean increase in area in any district producing oil palm was only about two percentage points, which is a doubling of area from a base of about 2% two per, two of land used for oil palm to about 4%. And that two percentage point increase should then, by his estimates, be associated with a, a decrease in poverty of about one half of 1% based on the 20% average poverty in those oil palm producing districts 
at the beginning of the period. So the bang is not really there, given the number of bucks that have been invested, or rather earned, by this industry. And that's a puzzle. Other studies uh, show something very similar. And we know, of course, that poverty changes are based on consumption effects. We read consumption data from Susanas, and we use those to compute uh, changes in poverty. So one thing we're interested in is what else are households doing with the money other than spending it on measurable consumption items, including durables like housing and motorcycles, uh, maybe smartphones and things like that. So uh, what, what's happening to household savings? What's happening to investment on uh, oil palm plantations? What are households doing perhaps about consumption smoothing? And what about uh, the longer term question of labor supply from oil palm producing households or households in oil palm intensive areas uh, uh, what, are they, what decisions are they making that are, uh, constitute changes in their investments in the human capital of the next generation? Are kids staying in school longer? Is that an investment that households are making? Or are they being pulled out to work in oil palm enterprises? Uh, that constitutes a very different kind of decision. And these are the indicators of longer term change that we're really trying to get a fix on. We don't have great data. Uh, uh, we have only mostly aggregate and provincial level data, as you'll see. So a lot of what we'll say from now on is going to be a bit speculative, but I hope it's enough to at least stimulate uh, discussion amongst us here. Okay, why do we care about all this? Well, number one uh, is, of course, poverty. Uh, the upward sloping lines are the nominal poverty lines in Indonesia from 2005 through to the end of last year. Uh, the downward sloping lines, the red one is the one to focus on, that's rural poverty in Indonesia. Uh, early 2000s, pretty substantial decline in poverty, as we all know. Uh, since then, it's leveled off, and there are lots of reasons why that might be, but the key point is it has leveled off in rural areas. So recent declines in poverty have been very small. In the oil palm areas themselves, there is no exceptional trend, given that overall trend, that is, oil palm... Uh, uh, pro the six provinces which produce 75% of oil palm production, uh, that's the six provinces there, uh, don't show exceptional declines in poverty relative to the national average. And in fact, uh, their poverty, their contribution to national poverty uh, has not changed uh, over this entire period from close to the beginning of the oil palm export boom until the present. So very small, almost not measurable impacts in poverty at the provincial level. Some evidence of small changes in poverty uh, based on household data, but really small changes is the key word. And that's a puzzle given the magnitude of the export growth shock that I've showed you already. Second reason why we care is volatility. Uh, world commodity prices, of course, are very volatile. Uh, so if you're engaged in palm oil production or oil palm production for sale to palm oil millers, then you're engaged in a very volatile industry. Uh, prices can fluctuate, as you saw, by a great deal. And so this matters because we care about volatility in the context of poverty in Indonesia. Lots and lots of households in Indonesia uh, exist just above the poverty line, and so volatility for them is a very real phenomenon, uh, a loss of revenue can drive them back below the poverty line quite quickly, as you all know. So if we think about the period of most rapid growth in prices, that's this period up to about 2008, then we see small but significant increases in household consumption. These are based on household level estimates, I'm sorry, these are based on district level estimates uh, uh, by uh, uh, another graduate student of mine working at the University of Wisconsin. And then if we look at the period when prices peak and then begin to decline, that's the second period here, we see that there's a very rapid response and also significant uh, of household consumption. It starts to go down again. So volatility, uh, as well as poverty, are issues to be concerned about. Third thing that we care about is how households uh, are able to reallocate their resources optimally, hopefully optimally, in response to a boom of this kind or in response to the potential gains from this boom. And once again, uh, we know that there's a very important macroeconomic context which is familiar to students of Dutch disease. That is, when you get a natural resource export boom, it hurts the other tradable sectors in the economy, especially manufacturing. And Indonesian manufacturing has not flourished in the uh, period 
that we're talking about since the early 2000s. It's grown a little bit, but it's grown much more slowly than the overall economy, and employment in manufacturing has grown almost not at all. So what used to be a good sector for kids to get jobs in has become much harder to access for young Indonesians. Instead, the growth of employment has been in the informal sector, in services such as uh, wholesale trade and warehousing and local transport and personal services and construction, all of these very familiar sectors where uh, wages are informal, where wages are not high, where skills are not valued, and as it happens, uh, real wages in those sectors have not increased all the way through this period. So that the gains from this 5% growth per year in GDP have not translated into increases in real wages for Indonesians, which is, again, kind of a puzzle. Even so, there is option value to rural households of being able to move out of agriculture into other sectors of the economy. That's something that's very important for the overall transition of the economy, and it's very important for long-run household economic welfare. So we care about the options that households have for, if you like, intergenerational portfolio diversification. That is, their kids getting jobs off the farm, outside of agriculture. And we know that in this context, there is a certain amount of rigidity built into the labor market. Uh, studies uh, uh, done in Indonesia and elsewhere show that if you begin your working career in agriculture, the probability that you will leave is actually very small. I call this the Hotel California effect. You can check out, but you can never leave, right? So you can start working, but uh, the probability that you'll leave agriculture altogether is actually quite small. So that really puts emphasis on school leavers uh, in the rural economy. If we want to have intergenerational economic mobility, then we have to be able to give school leavers the opportunity to make decisions about where they begin their career. If they start in oil palm or in agriculture generally, then chances are they're going to stay there for their career and be subject to the same kind of volatility as their parents were before. So we care about labor mobility. As I mentioned, wages in the expanding sectors of the economy, that is, service sectors down here, uh, not only low in productivity terms, here is productivity, but it affects wages, uh, not only low, but also very flat right through this period. If we look at the agricultural real wage, that's the blue line, uh, very flat all the way through this period. Uh, compare it with the construction real wage, there's a pretty substantial gap between the two. So it still makes sense to want to move out of agriculture, even though real wages are not expected to rise, because the gap is still large enough to give you incentive to move. But overall, uh, we're interested in how the gains from this boom can be converted into opportunities for the children of current farmers or current plantation employees to do something else with their lives, to experience greater opportunities for economic mobility. Last reason, and a more familiar one for many uh, people in this room, I think, is what happens to the windfall earnings uh, when households receive them? So, what are their options? Well, option number one, of course, is you can spend it. You can buy better stuff, and you can buy more stuff. You can consume more, including more consumer durables. You can build a better house or improve your existing house, buy a motorcycle, trade up to a better uh, vehicle, all of those kinds of things. And that's a very reasonable way to expect a lot of this earnings gain to be disposed. Uh, what's the impact on poverty reduction? Well, we measure poverty from consumption expenditures. It's going to be reflected in... Uh, in the poverty numbers very clearly. What about longer term effects from that spending? Not so clear, right? What are the sustained growth uh, implications of spending on, on these things? Well, maybe improving the house is a good thing. Maybe getting a vehicle enables some other opportunities. But in general, uh, it's not so clear what the, what the long term implications of that spending are. Another option, and another very logical one, is to increase spending on the, on the family enterprise. That is to plow back some of your extra earnings into the oil palm enterprise itself. So expand the area, plant more trees, use more fertilizer, whatever, uh, all of those things. So uh, that makes a lot of sense. It's probably the highest return project that most farmers can uh, conceive of, uh, given that they have limited access to a broader capital market. And so probably there's a lot of that going on, and we see that in the supply response of smallholder oil palm production. However, when you invest back in the 
uh, oil palm operation, you are, of course, increasing the share of your stake in a very volatile enterprise. So you're increasing, not reducing, your vulnerability to future shocks from world prices or from other sources as well. So it's not a great strategy in the long run. It may work in the short run while prices are high. Clearly, the two things that we really want to think about and we want to favor as longer-term development strategies, both for households and for the country as a whole, are the last two here. That's why I gave them check marks. Right? First is, uh, what about saving, and in particular, saving not in the form of stuff stashed under the bed, but rather saving through financial intermediaries, through the financial uh, system. Obviously, this is secure. right? Uh, obviously, it gives you access to uh, consumption smoothing and also to portfolio diversification because by saving in a bank, then you are uh, you're not putting all of your financial eggs into one basket, the household enterprise. Uh, you've got financial assets as well as real property assets. They're going to move differently as the economy changes. So uh, it's a good idea. And secondly, of course, there are macroeconomic benefits as well because the financial system can pool these resources and then allocate them uh, as loans to investors seeking the highest return project so that there's a better chance of a macroeconomic gain when households in the oil palm sector are able to save through the financial system. Second, investment in human capital. This, of course, is the key to long-run uh, economic mobility for everybody. And in the case of Indonesia, uh, it's very, very important. Indonesia has lagged in educational terms. Uh, in particular, rural areas, uh, schooling attainment is not especially high. Uh, any investment in education means increased labor mobility and, of course, a greater probability that children who uh, grow up in a household in a rural area will have a wider set of opportunities for their own careers and their own uh, economic futures. So these are the two things that we're really interested in trying to promote uh, as long-run dividends both for the household and for the economy as a whole from the uh, resource export, from the decentralized resource export boom. Okay, so how much of this, if any, can we see happening uh, in the uh, oil palm producing areas? Uh, first of all, what about the uh, financial uh, intermediation story? Well, we know that there are strong motivations to save in a bank. We know that this is going to uh, diversify household portfolios. It turns out that rural banking in Indonesia, as you all know very well, uh, is not that well developed, even if it is making quite good progress uh, in current years. So the most recent survey data that I can find from the Financial Inclusion Insights Survey, uh, which was undertaken, I think, with BRI as a uh, collaborator, and I'm not sure about that, um, shows only about 12% of rural Indonesians have active uh, uh, bank accounts. Uh, access to bank branches is okay, but it's not great. Uh, there are about four bank branches per 10,000 people, and that number is pretty much constant right across rural Indonesia. It doesn't vary. It's not higher in oil palm areas or lower uh, than in other uh, areas. And in terms of mobile money, which of course is uh, very much uh, uh, on the up uptick in Indonesia cities, not a lot of uptake in rural Indonesia uh, as yet. And not all of this is because households are being ineligible to be participants in the formal financial system. In fact, uh, a study as far back as 2008, this one conducted with BRI, went out and evaluated the creditworthiness of households in a very large nationally representative sample and found that about 40% of poor households in the sample were deemed creditworthy by BRI, by very strict, very conservative standards by BRI, but only about 10% actually made use of banking opportunities. So there's another kind of constraint here. It's probably about financial inclusion, that is, access to banking services, rather than the creditworthiness or the uh, financial literacy of the households themselves. So there's a puzzle there, again, to be resolved. Okay. Uh, as a consequence of all of this, savings growth in the palm oil intensive provinces, that's the bars in red, has not been uh, higher than the national average, the green bar in Indonesia, uh, over the period from uh, uh, to, uh, 2011 to 2017. Growth in savings has been below the national average in those uh, palm oil producing areas. So we don't see a big boom in accessing the financial system by, by households in provinces that are experiencing uh, a resource export boom uh, 
in the most direct uh, possible way. What about human capital investments? Uh, uh, in the aggregate, there's been a big increase in the quantity of schooling in Indonesia. There are very big questions about improvements in the quality of schooling. That's another study uh, for another day. Um, but when we look at the oil palm intensive provinces of the country, we don't see any special differences there again. We don't see that they are very different in terms of uh, percentage of out-of-school children. So the red boxes enclose the six provinces that are account for 75% of oil palm production. Um, the width of this bar uh, is a measure of the percentage of 16 to 18 year old school children in poor households who are out of school. So a longer bar means more out of school kids or less progression to senior high school, to upper secondary school. And again, you can see that these provinces are not special. They're just in the middle of the pack. So there's not evidence of big investments in keeping kids in school. In the, uh, in the areas that benefited most from the oil palm export boom. Uh, so is this average or...? These, these are averages per province, yeah, that's right. For yeah. how many years? During uh, the period of... Uh, no, no, no. This is, uh, this is based on a one-year survey, and I'm going to say the... Hmm? Rashid is going to look it up. It's about 2011 or 12 from memory, but we'll, we'll get a definitive uh, take on that in just a moment. We, we want to show the trend in this, but we don't yet have the data. We're working on it. Yeah, it's a good question, thank you. Okay. Now, when it comes to household investments in the oil time areas, once again, we see that there is evidence of volatility, and that that volatility also translates into human capital investments, that is, spending on schooling. And I should have mentioned earlier, these numbers are for oil time areas relative to non-oil time areas. So these are relative shocks, not absolute shocks, but it, once again what they show is the following. During the period of the most <coughs> rapid growth in uh, oil palm prices and export uh, growth, we see no significant change in the uh, investment in education in oil palm intensive areas relative to other areas of the country. And then when prices start to level off and even to fall, we see a significant decline in those areas relative to other areas of the country. So there is no evidence, in fact, maybe some contrary evidence for increased human capital investment in the oil palm uh, producing areas of the country. So these two things, uh, uh, no evidence of, well, three things, I guess, very little evidence of sustained poverty reduction, uh, very little evidence that households are using the financial system to smooth consumption or to diversify their assets, and very little evidence that they are engaging in the most important intergenerational <coughs> transfer of gains, which is to educate their children. None of these things show up in the oil palm producing areas. And that's a little bit troubling, because if we compare back to the old uh, grandfather year uh, uh, resource export boom, then after some bad starts, in the late 1970s and into the early mid-1980s, there was tremendous development spending out of oil and gas revenues. And that spending, okay, it wasn't 100% efficient, but it paid off in terms of overall economic growth for Indonesia. And here's a boom which is of roughly equivalent magnitude, sustained over a longer period of time, and at least by these indicators, we're not seeing strong evidence either of microeconomic gains or, imp by implication, of macroeconomic gains other than through the uh, earnings from resource exports themselves. So then the question is, well, what might be done that's different to try to take advantage of this natural resource export boom and do what the sustainability people tell us should be done, which is convert natural resource wealth into other forms of wealth that are reproducible and that have better links to a dynamically growing economy. So how do we go about uh, doing that in the context of a decentralized resource export boom. That is, one in which the government does not pull all of the policy levers concerning the disposition of the export growth. So, as I've said at the start, uh, current economic conditions in Indonesia and in the global economy, at least until this week, have been very favorable uh, for thinking about policy reform. After all, a 13 or 14 year sustained rapid growth of the economy creates a lot of opportunities for policy reform. There's some, there's some uh, space in the system to undertake uh, new policies now 
before times get hard. And of course, in your grandfather's Indonesia, the rule was Sadley's law, which is bad times make for good policies. But there's no reason why good times can't make for good policies as well. And that's what repairing the roof while the sun is shining is all about. How do we go about doing that? Well, first thing that we think is very important is to assist households with consumption smoothing and with portfolio diversification so they can lock in the gains for current generations and uh, reduce their dependence on a very volatile industry. How to go about doing that? Well, uh, existing efforts to improve financial intermediation, to improve financial inclusion for rural Indonesians should be stepped up. It should be intensified. And I know there's a lot of progress. We've, we've met several uh, key people in, in, in the Indonesian government in the last few days who've told us about progress, but I'm sure uh, more focus on this will also pay dividends uh, in the future. Uh, efforts to improve branchless banking, a really great idea, by the way, uh, should be stepped up. It should be really focused on, I think, as a way of bringing banks closer to people who might make use of a bank if it were more accessible to them. Uh, obviously, improvements in mobile money systems makes a lot of sense as well because just about everybody has a phone these days. And even if it's not a smartphone, you can still use near-field communication <coughs> technology to engage in banking. So those options are very much open. This will help to lock in gains to the current generation. It will reduce uh, dependence on a volatile industry, uh, that is uh, uh, export agriculture. And, of course, by increasing the use of financial intermediation, that is the formal financial system, it will also pay dividends in the aggregate because the banking system will be made uh, uh, better off for this and there will be more opportunities to pool resources and allocate them to investments that will pay off uh, for national economic growth. So that's number one. Number two, uh, improving labor mobility and human capital investments. Well, this is a no-brainer as well, right? There's nothing surprising here. Uh, uh, obviously, the more we do that, the more we reduce this idea of a you can check out of agriculture, but you can never leave, the Hotel California effect. Uh, the more we assist households to promote uh, exit from agriculture by their children, the more we give those children options to be participants in a broader economy. That, the key to that, of course, is education, but there's more to it than that as well. So two areas where I think careful focus on policy, while there is some fiscal space, really makes a lot of sense. OK, one more slide, then I'm done. And that slide begins like this. OK, so up till now, I've told you a story about approximately 600% increase in revenues from palm oil exports uh, to the Indonesian economy. That's a really big number for a pretty big industry. And I've told you stories about households in which we don't see strong evidence that those households have really gained. Uh, certainly not 600% gains, right? In term, when we look at poverty numbers and spending and everything else, nothing like it. Maybe two orders of magnitude smaller than 600% is closer to the truth. So then the but is this. What if it's not the case that most of the gains from palm oil export growth have actually accrued to the households and the plantation workers and the other people that we've been focusing on uh, so far today. What if they're being absorbed through endogenous marketing margins of millers and traders and other people involved in this industry uh, so that actually most of the gains from this windfall are not going to the households we've been talking about but are being absorbed as rents by a much smaller group of individuals and corporations engaged in the rural Indonesian economy. Just saying what if because I don't know. And one of the key pieces of information that we would really love to have is evidence on the extent to which world prices actually pass through to farm gate prices because so far we don't have any evidence on that score. We don't know what percentage of a world price increase actually shows up as higher prices to oil palm smallholders. An amazing uh, gap in our knowledge given the magnitude of this, uh, of this phenomenon. So, so we're speculating here and the speculation is what if households are really not getting all of that money and so everything we've talked about up till now is kind of hypothetical because it's a hypothetical increase in household uh, spending opportunities. And instead, most of it's going to a very small group of individuals and corporations. Well, guess what? 
uh, we still get Dutch, we still get Dutch disease in the economy because they're still spending from the oil palm export boom. So it still damages job opportunities. It still has impacts on the manufacturing sector, which are negative. So all of that stuff still goes through, no matter who gets the money, as long as they spend it back in the economy. So that stuff doesn't change. What does change, of course, is the distribution of gains across individuals and corporations in rural and indeed in all of uh, Indonesia uh, as a consequence of this potential uh, industry uh, structure that we're speculating about here. And some of the things that we can think of that are consistent with a much more concentrated capture of rents from the resource export windfalls are higher inequality, which is a fact over this period of time, uh, smaller effects on poverty and household welfare, which appears to be a fact as well. We don't see much action there. And, and as a consequence of that, it may also be, and this is another policy area, that the lack of distribution of this very large windfall is not only contributing little to macroeconomic improvement, but is even crowding in spending on social protection. So you think about all of the initiatives that Indonesia has undertaken, the admirable initiatives to build a social safety net, to target the poor more accurately, to make sure that those who are targeted as poor get the kind of advantages and opportunities and benefits that they need in a wide range of activities. Fantastic initiatives, okay? But that's very, very costly. Even building the database to know who the poor are so as to target them, even that is very costly. And then there's the programs themselves the unconditional cash transfers, the cash transfers, the subsidies, and so on. Okay? Now, if the gains from this very large export boom are not accruing to smallholders and workers on oil palm plantations who live in poor parts of rural Indonesia, then, of course, they remain much more eligible for those social protection programs, and we're crowding in spending because they get defined as poor, when, in fact, uh, the product of their labor, if you like, is being captured as rents by other agents in the economy. So if that speculation is true, then of course the kind of policies that I mentioned about improving household access to the banking system and improving household access to schooling, they don't go away, but they become part of a much larger set of policies which has to think about how the gains from this resource boom are captured and allocated in an economy where the government is not the primary agent for the export earnings, but other individuals and corporations are. So that's a different set of policies. And with that, I'm going to say, Terima kasih. And uh, as you can see, we have a long way to go yet, so we really welcome your suggestions. Thank you. Where the government is not the primary agent. So that's a different... My name is Danny from the Microfidential Department. Well, my first question is about the uh, idea the household behavior in Indonesia. Uh, isn't it like uh, the, the fact that the, the marginal perspective to consume in, for Indonesian household is quite big? We can see from the uh, statistics, uh, the, uh, from the inclusion or the uh, access for banking as well. And from our statistics, the uh, national, we have a st uh, statistics called national balance sheet uh, that can see the pattern of the, uh, the behavior of the uh, uh, every agent in the economy. Let's say uh, normally a household is a net lender to the economy, mm -hmm. while the, uh, the corporation or firm is the net borrower. But when I, when I try to compare the national balance sheet of Indonesia and the U.S., in U.S., uh, the household is pretty constant becoming the net uh, lender. Yeah. But in Indonesia, uh, across periods, Sometimes they become a net borrower, so the position change, although it's not a, it's not a structural, it's more of a temporary issue. Sure. So, in that sense, uh, we, we could uh, conclude that the, the household condition is the, in the margin, is the, uh, sort of marginal, mm -hmm. because of their, uh, their uh, characteristic of the high MPC. So with this uh, volatility in the uh, commodity prices, is it like a special a policy or a particular policy that could shift the MPC to more MPS? Yeah. That's what my first question. Yeah. My second question is like, 
the uh, characteristic of uh, Indonesian uh, society. We are more like saving society than investment society. Uh, we don't have a very good uh, assessment on risk and return. Uh, a lot of proof, like uh, a lot of uh, only few uh, less uh, domestic involvement in the capital market. Well, capital market is dominated by foreign uh, foreign uh, investors yeah. first, and then a lot of uh, events in uh, like uh, mutual fund redemption because they didn't realize the. Uh, uh, the volatility in the, the bond uh, price. And the third proof is like uh, household prefer to invest in housing, not in the, uh, uh, not in the capital market. Because in, in the housing market, they have a, like a puzzle that housing market has a very high return with no risk. Yeah. That's the, uh, the puzzle. Mm. So again, the question is how to, to shift uh, the, the behavior from saving society to investment society. That's also the key. So that, yeah, that's my uh, question. Uh, my name is Jonathan Penkins. I'm from the Roger Wallen Foundation. Hello, Jonathan. Uh, thanks for a really excellent presentation, very thought provoking, and a lot of information there. My question is um, more of a statistical one, which is looking at you used poverty as uh, movements in poverty. Um, as an indicator on the x-axis, and I wonder if because Indonesia's poverty line is actually so low, I mean it's one of the lowest in the region, um, whether that is measuring a group of people that is less affected by income from palm oil because they're effectively not owners, they're very, very poor, they're not owners of anything, they're basically migrant laborers. And migrant Susanas in Indonesia, which does some things quite well, measures the expenditure patterns of migrants extremely poorly, mostly because they drop out of the survey. Yep. So I'm wondering if there's a, because we're measuring such a small group of people with a poverty line being so low, and those people fall out of the expenditure survey, that there might be some statistical noise there. Um, and, and following on from that, if that is the case, or something like something like that has affected the, the results, um, the obvious explanation is that Indonesia is a labor surplus economy. Yeah. Indonesia has done very, as you pointed out, has done not such a great job in creating employment, particularly because of the very slow growth of manufactured exports and uh, actually fall of manufacturing exports in some years. Lessons from the rest of the region are that if you really want to increase the living standards of the very poorest, and that is what we're talking about with Indonesia's very low poverty line, that increasing manufacturing exports and generating a labor demand is really the best way to do it. That's the one thing that really differentiates Indonesia from places like Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe I still have a, I have a concern. Actually. The first is in the household of Indonesia has been divided as uh, you previously mentioned that actually if we see the balance, national balance sheet, actually thirty percent of national assets is from the household sectors. So it's mean that sometimes if you also have uh, experiencing like the uh, net borrowing, net borrowing is supposed to be a net lending uh, for the uh, also behavior, but sometimes uh, the household or the nation sector is experiencing that more you would feel that uh, they spend if the, uh, the, the liquidity is not to the uh, financial intermediaries, but to uh, uh, fix a set, like a property and also other non productive effects such as clothes. So in this, in, in, in this case, I think, uh, actually I do, uh, my previous study is about the household resiliency, so I connected to the the, the asset of the household to to a financial margin. So, uh, how is the resiliency of household itself? If there is any shock happened to the household, and it's showing that the asset of the uh, household is quite uh, resilient. So, it's mean that actually, uh, I don't know if you can say that there is actually uh, have an impact to the uh, welfare of the household, but not through the financial intermediaries, but also to other uh, transmission like uh, the financial access such as the property and any other non-productive assets. The second one is um, 
uh, if you mention that probably if there is a human investment is in the education, I'm just asking your view on what about the investment to the health? Yeah. Because as you know that the current uh, life expectancy of the, uh, the household is like a 70 years, something like that, so I think it's quite increasing. And also, I think the whole economy that's also a big impact because we are reducing the uh, uh, health insurance of the nation as the, uh, the whole nation. Wow. <laughs> uh, shall, I, shall I answer these first? And then... hmm? Yes. Okay, yeah. So thank, uh, thank you all. Really, really perceptive uh, points and questions. And uh, I've taken a lot of notes and I'm just going to think about them all because I don't have ready answers for most of this. Um, Danny, I guess uh, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for what you offered there. Um, I think uh, one part of the answer uh, both, uh, to both of your questions, actually, is that, is that statements about what's happening on average uh, in Indonesia and statements about what's happening in uh, the populations most, in theory, at least most affected by this boom may not be entirely consistent with one another, right? So, uh, so we, given the magnitude of the boom, if a significant fraction of that boom is really reaching households, even if they're extremely poor households, uh, then we would expect those households to pretty quickly become net lenders, unless, of course, they're not making use of the financial system. Am I, am I right about that? So that the average household might be a wash, might be in some years net borrower, in some years net lender, but, but in these particular areas, during this particular episode, we would, ex we would expect to see a much higher tendency for net lending than net borrowing. I guess that's a part of my answer uh, to the points that you made. Um, both of you also made the point about uh, preferences among households for investment in real property. Very understandable. Um, uh, uh, and we would be very surprised if a, very, if a big fraction of this income gain were not being spent on housing, uh, on real property of all kinds, and that would be perfectly normal and very natural. And it's not a bad thing, right? Um, uh, the real question is, what is the opportunity cost of investments made by households there, in well, investments of durable consumption uh, spending by households, uh, versus what else they might be doing with that, with that revenue, and that I'm not so clear on. But but clearly, it's a question that that operates at a policy level, when the scale of the spending is very large. So, so again, how do you change culture? I don't know. Uh, how do you make people feel more confident? that an investment in, for example, their children's education is of equal value to uh, building an extension to their house? I don't know. Maybe that's something that's not uh, subject for this audience, but for a much broader audience in the Indonesian policy sphere. Right? And that's a long-term project. So I don't think those are very satisfactory answers to the questions and the comments that you made, but, but uh, you've helped me to think about those things a little more. Jonathan. Uh, it's nice to meet you, by the way. I've read your work at a distance for a long time, so I'm very happy to be face to face with you. And, and uh, the points you make, of course, resonate very strongly in Vietnam, where you've done this kind of work before. And I appreciate that uh, very much. Um, uh, good point about the poverty line. I don't know. Uh, we, it may be that we're not really measuring the population we believe we're measuring. Um, if that's the case, then we have, we have the data to go back in and look at those uh, in different different quintiles of the distribution and see what's happening further up. And that would be an obvious research project in response to your, to your first point, at least. Um, uh, uh, second point about uh, Indonesia being a labor surplus economy. Yes, and this is perhaps the key uh, policy problem. Well, this is the key policy problem for a poverty-oriented, uh, household welfare-oriented, long-run policy strategy, which is how do you create jobs that not only pay well, but also reward investments in education so that individuals can do well and they can transmit those gains to their children in the form of better health and better educational investments so that uh, we put the economy on a very different path. Indonesia has not done well by regional standards in this respect. And we can blame natural resource wealth for part of that. I don't know what fraction of it, but certainly for part of it. Uh, uh, the project of changing that is a, is a very big one and much bigger than, I think, dealing with 
just the resource boom that we're talking about, but thematically it's the same. How do you take all of these gains from natural resource wealth and lock them in to a pattern of growth in the future which is going to change the economy's dependence on those resources and make it a much more dynamic, much more engaged participant in the global value-added uh, uh, system, which means how do you convert natural resource wealth into dynamism in manufacturing and logistics and uh, traded services and other sectors which grow with the, with the global economy in a very robust way. And I wish I had an answer to that. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I don't. Uh, last thing, uh, uh, health spending as well as education. I didn't show you, but the same numbers that I showed you for relative spending on, uh, on education are also reflected in relative spending on health. So I could have uh, pulled those out. And they show the same, essentially the same thing, which is there's an increase in health spending by oil palm intensive households uh, during the period when prices are rising fastest. When prices level off, that spending also goes down. So it looks like the same pattern, or a very similar pattern, to the one that I showed you for education. Well